Good morning, Southside Bible Church. Special welcome. Any guests, anyone with us this morning? We're glad on a snowy morning that you came to worship our God together. Uh, this morning, we're going to be going to the, to the Lord's table. This is a special time as a body uh, to remember, and I'm eager to eat this table with you this morning. We've been going through this book. I asked you if you wanted to, to follow along this year. And uh, as we come to the table, this chapter, I'm just going to read to you, to kind of get our hearts ready uh, as we begin. It said, corporate worship is designed to help you take the eyes of your heart off the difficulties of your situation and focus them on the grace and glory of your ever-present Savior. And he's written a poem. <clears throat> I have an eyesight problem. It's not that my physical eyes are fading. My problem is the eyes of my heart. I often lack the clarity of vision, the sightedness that is needed to live as you intended. To live with a moral purpose, to live with a submissive heart, to live free of complaint, to live gratefully, to live with joy and to live with a restful heart, to live with confidence in you, Lord, to live for a glory greater than my own, to live with eternity in view, to live with an unshakable hope, to live with humble courage, to live a life shaped by love, to live willing to forgive and to live out of a generous heart, to live grieved over my sin, and to live committed to confession and repentance, to live resting in Christ's righteousness, to live a life of faith and not of fear, to live believing that you've given me everything that I need, to live free of idol worship, to live with a tender, malleable heart, to live to really live. I too often let struggles and disappointments of life dominate my vision. My interpretation is that I'm temporarily blind to you, to your presence, your promises, your power, and your ever active grace. When I do this, I let trouble define me. I let disappointments tell me who I am. I let the unwanted and unexpected shape how I think about my life and my potential. I let fear overwhelm faith, and I let complaint replace praise. I let my blindness cause me to wonder where you are, what you're doing, and if you hear my cries, and if your promises are still reliable. I let my blindness cause me to bring you into the court of my judgment, questioning your faithfulness and your love. So I run again with your people to your temple, not just to sing the songs of redemption, not just to hear your word's instruction, but aided by these things to open the eyes of my heart, Lord to gaze upon your beauty once again and to have vision corrected once again in the gathering of the saints so that I once again see you in glory and your splendor and the majesty of your grace and having looked on your beauty to bow in joyful surrender and rise to live with hope restored and courage of faith renewed. Let's pray. Father, I pray that for our gathered assembly this morning. I pray that you would reorient us right now into your greatness and your majesty. I pray that as we gaze upon Christ this morning, thank you for the table. Thank you for brothers and sisters to sit shoulder and shoulder together and remember such a blessedness. Thank you, Jesus. I'm forever grateful. So Lord, do more than we could hope now in the gathered assembly to restore our souls and bless us as we open this word and as we remember the Lord's death, I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, this morning, we're going to look at the Lord's table at the close of our service. What, what a high blessing for the people of God. And in order to prepare our hearts for this remembrance, I would like you to turn over to Exodus chapter 12. And in Exodus chapter 12, we're going to study the Passover. Uh, my heart has been so blessed this week in studying this, it's just, it's excellent. And I pray that God would do the same thing in your heart that he did for me this week. As I pondered this and studied, it hit me that the Passover meal is so central to, to us as Christians and to Judaism. 
Judaism, the Passover meal was the most important remembrance to this people. Afterwards, they were always looking back to it. They celebrated it every year. It's just kind of what defined and marked them as a people. And now Christianity this morning, as Joel read, I'm going to call it the revised Passover meal is the communion table, and it's our central act of worship. And so this morning, we, we gather to remember this is what the core of all of our faith is and what we hold to and hope and believe in. For 2,000 years, the church of God has gathered all over the world and said, do this in remembrance of me. And the Exodus is the redemption of the Old Testament. Everything after this moment was to point God's people back to that great event. When that great Exodus, we will remember this morning, has pointed the people of God back to the cross of Christ, the, the significance of our Passover. <clears throat> so today, we're going to look at this, and I was just thinking of John the Baptist when he, he just one day stands up and says, behold, the, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And Jesus says there was no prophet greater than John. I'm like, there were some great prophets. Why John? And every prophet said the Lamb of God is going to come. And John was the first one who said, behold, he's come. Behold the Lamb of God. And now he says, and you who are least in the kingdom of God are greater than John the Baptist. Because now he dwells within us as the new covenant people of God. And so you're greater than John the Baptist because you don't say, behold the Lamb. The Lamb dwells within me by his Spirit. This is big. <laughs> this is big. So what I'd like to do is, you know what, I'm not going to, yeah, I am. Turn to Exodus 12. Um, let me just read verses 1 through 13, and then we'll pray. Now the Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, this month shall be the beginning of the months for you, and it's to be the first month of the year to you. Speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, on the 10th of this month, they are each one to take a lamb for themselves according to their father's households, a lamb for each household. Now, if the household is too small for a lamb, then he and his neighbor nearest to his house are to take one according to the number of persons in them, according to what each man should eat, you're to divide the lamb. And your lamb shall be an unblemished male, a year old, and you may take it from the sheep or from the goats, and you shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month and then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel is to kill it at twilight. Moreover, they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and on the lintel and on the houses in which they eat. And they shall eat the flesh that same night, roasted with fire, and they shall eat it with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled at all with water, but rather roasted with fire, both its head and its legs, along with its entrails. And you shall not leave any of it over until morning. But whatever is left of it in morning, you shall burn with fire. And now you shall eat it in the manner with your loins girded, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will go through the land of Egypt on that night. And will strike down the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And against the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgments, for I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you live. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. God, I pray for your blessing upon this word this morning. Give us eyes to see. Amen. <clears throat> the Exodus is a beautiful section of Scripture. And as we watch this drama unfold this morning of God liberating His people from the bondage and slavery that they were in in Egypt. And so how did Israel come to be in bondage in Egypt? If you'll recall, God called out Abraham and He called him out to be the head of a new nation that He will be their God and they will be His people. And as you watch the history of this nation unfold in the Old Testament, it ends up that Joseph, Jacob's son, is sold into slavery by his brothers, and he ends up in Egypt. And through a series of providential events, 
he's eventually raised up to be the second in command of the greatest nation on the face of the earth. And then when a time of famine came, he ends up saving his whole family to keep this lineage of Israel alive for Messiah to come from. And this family now, with the hand of God upon it, blossoms and just prospers greatly in the land. And then Joseph dies and a new Pharaoh comes into power who did not know Joseph. And he was threatened by the growing people in the midst of their land. And so they're, they're, they're mistreated now and they're made into slaves to keep them down. And they're under harsh conditions and beatings and they're there for 430 years. And it says at the beginning of Exodus that God hears their cries, deliver me from this slavery and bondage. And God raises up Moses to deliver them from this great bondage and slavery that they have been living in. And in Exodus, you watch this amazing battle between these two sovereigns. You look at Pharaoh, who is the world power king, and you're going to look at Yahweh, who is the king of kings. And Moses asks Pharaoh, he comes and says, let God's people go. Let, let my people go and worship in the wilderness. And nine times Pharaoh says no, and there's great plagues that are brought upon the land of Egypt. And in the land of Goshen, where Israel lives, the plagues never enter in and never touch the people of God. So this morning, we come then to the 10th and final plague that would send Israel packing and on the move toward the land that God has promised them flowing with milk and honey. And God's going to give extended instruction for Israel to prepare for this final plague that we will look at. All the other plagues, it's interesting, Israel had nothing to do. They're in the land of Goshen, and it just happened, and those frogs and hail and all that came never touched them. And now you look, uh, look at Exodus eleven seven. 7. But against any of the sons of Israel, a dog will not even bark, whether against man or beast, that you may understand how the Lord makes a distinction between Egypt and and Israel. And so God is making a distinction between these peoples. <clears throat> In this last plague, God is telling Israel that they need to take action. And so my question is, why not just extend favor like you did in the first nine plagues? They didn't have to do anything to prepare. And this one, there's this long preparation. Why such elaborate plans? And I think it's a great question. Why do they need to prepare if this is God judging Pharaoh and his people for abusing the people of God? And I believe the clear answer is that the Lord has purposes in the Passover, as it will be, become a big foundation of the entire Bible. I think the lamb seems to be the foundation stone of the entire Bible. And as you track it and you just keep seeing the lamb and, and how it's used. And we read in our prayer group this morning in Revelation with the lamb of God on the throne at the end and everybody worshiping the lamb. And so I, I see the lamb of God as one of the foundation stones of our Bible. And so let's take a look at this. Exodus 6, 6 through 7. Say therefore to the sons of Israel, I am the Lord and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will deliver you from their bondage. <clears throat> I will also redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgments. And then I will take you for my people, and I'll be your God, and you shall know that I'm the Lord your God who brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. Foundation again of the Bible. So we have two purposes that God's given to Moses now, to deliver them from bondage, to deliver them from the abusive rule of Pharaoh and their slavery. And second, he says, I will redeem you. I will purchase you. I will take you to be my people. And so our whole picture is, I'm going to bring you out from slavery and bondage, and, and I'm going to do it by the way of a Passover lamb, and I'm going to bring you to be my people. And so here's the whole gospel that we're going to look at in the Passover. So it's not just judgment upon Egypt, but go and live in the, pro in the presence of God and go into the promised land. True freedom is now slavery to the sons of God, to bring them from bondage into relationship. So let's come together and look at this Passover. Beautiful truths. Let's just start. I'm going to read it again, not the whole thing, but just a few verses at a time. Verses 1 through 2. Now the Lord said to Moses, 
and Aaron and the land of Egypt. This month shall be the beginning of months for you. It's to be the first month of the year to you. So as we begin, this is going to be a monumental deliverance. It's going to come in late March, early April, and it's going to be during the month of the barley harvest. And he's telling them, you're going to reset your calendars. Your very existence is going to be forged now upon this event. This is your new year. This is your 4th of July, so to speak. And this month will be the beginning of a new existence. It will be your memorial day. The Passover is that the old has passed away and the new has come. Um, Just gospel. And this is all going to be centered around the lamb. And there's going to be great detail about the lamb in this section. Because as the avenger comes, look at Exodus 12, 23. There's an avenger that's going to come and kill those firstborn. But the Lord will pass through and smite the Egyptians. And when he sees the blood on the lintel and on the two doorposts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not allow the destroyer to come into your houses and smite you. So the avenger is going to come and he will come and he's going to unleash a devastating judgment, which is going to be typological as well. It is breathtaking in this context what is about to break loose. And he's going to unleash an unstoppable force in the universe. And I want you to hear this. The, the, the judgment and wrath of God is unstoppable. And there's no force that can stop it. One preacher said the greatest military power known in the history of the world was Egypt. And the destroyer is going to go through it like a hot knife through butter. And he's going to just come and move. And there's going to be weeping through this whole country. The only way to be protected from such a fierce judgment is a lamb. Pretty amazing. There's only one thing that can stop the avenger. And it's going to be the blood of the lamb. And that's why these details are so important and I want to look at them. So come with me to verse 3. So speak to all the congregation of Israel saying, on the 10th of this month, they are each one to take a lamb for themselves according to their father's households, a lamb for each household. So now you go out and you're going to select a lamb on the 10th of the month And you're going to take a lamb uh, from each family unit. Each household is going to go get their own lamb. Verse 4 then, if the household is too small for a whole lamb, then he and his neighbor nearest to his house are to take one according to the number of persons in them. According to what each man should eat, you're to divide the lamb. And so if it's a small family, go get other households around because the lamb needs to be eaten fully. In verse 10, he says, don't leave any of it until morning. And if there is, burn the leftovers. And so all were to come and eat the lamb, and they were to eat all of it, not just pieces or parts. They're to eat the whole lamb, and we'll look into John 6 here in a second. Verse 5, your lamb shall be an unblemished male, a year old. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. So it's not just any lamb. You go get one that is unblemished, it must be perfect, and it must have no defect. And in my mind, uh, it doesn't matter if it has a defect, it's going to taste the same, it's going to do the same thing. So God has something big when he's saying, I want a perfect lamb. I want one with no defects. This requirement of perfection had to be more than just a meal, but the symbolic nature, for sure, of the, the lamb of God who would come into the world, that would be perfect. God would accept only a perfect sacrifice. God requires this to ever have one that can remove and take away sin. And if not, the sacrifice would need a sacrifice. So it has to be a lamb that is perfect, perfect, spotless, unblemished. And it was to be a male, which I think is our typology as well. Verse 6, you shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month. And then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel is to kill it (coughs) at twilight. It was to be killed at the twilight. And the whole nation is now you have all the households simultaneously slaying the lamb by cutting its throat with a violent death. Uh, It wasn't just meat for the table. There's something big going on. And all these lambs 
being slaughtered at once in Goshen. In verse 7, moreover, they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and on the lintel of the houses which they eat. And so the, I heard this one gentleman, I think, I think his name was Marv, but he, he said the, the lentils, the way you would take this with the hyssop is you would go down and then on the two doorposts you'd go across. And so more than likely it was, it was blood uh, in the shape of a cross. And then in verse 8, they shall eat the flesh that same night, roasted with fire, and they shall eat it with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. You shall eat the lamb in the same night. It's not to be boiled. It's not to be raw. It needs to be roasted by fire in entirety. And so it needs to be consumed. And you need to eat it with unleavened bread, matzah, uh, no time to let it rise. And the, the unleavened bread of our, of our slavery and our bondage. Uh, and then the bitter herbs, Exodus 1.14, uh, that they made their lives bitter with hard labor and mortar and bricks and all kinds of labor in the field and all their labors rig- rigorously imposed upon them. So the, the slavery and the bitterness of, of living under it. Verse 9, do not eat any of it raw or boiled at all with water, but rather roasted with fire, both its head and its legs, along with its entrails. And so the whole thing is to be consumed And in verse 10, you shall not leave any of it over until morning, but whatever is left of it in morning, you shall burn with fire. And so I just want you to see very clearly it's to be consumed and there is to be nothing left over of this lamb. And now he's going to shift and he's going to talk about the manner in which we're going to eat this meal. And in verse 11, now you shall eat it in this manner with your loins girded and your sandals on your feet and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Paschal Lamb, Passover. And so the way we're to eat this is with your loins girded. And we've seen this uh, in the believer's armor and all of that, where they had long flowing robes. And if you're going to go into battle, you had to lift those robes up in the belt of truth and you would gird it up so you would be ready to move quickly. And so you're to be ready for this great deliverance that's going to come quickly. And your sandals, uh, usually you, you take them off and you sit at the table, you would wash the feet when they would walk in. And he's saying, keep your sandals on your feet. And your staff, you would set it you know, at, at the door when you would walk in. He said, just keep it in your hand so you can be ready to, to take off quickly. And so you are now dressed in readiness as you celebrate to take off on your march to freedom. Your redemption is drawing nigh, Israel. And it's interesting that we're called to do the same thing as we wait for our second coming of Jesus to be dressed in readiness. And so they're dressed here in readiness, waiting for this Passover. And then the the verses that just jump out in verse 12. (coughs) For I will go through the land of Egypt on that night, and I will strike down all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgments. I I am the Lord. And the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you live. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And no plague will befall you to destroy you, the destroyer, when I strike the land of Egypt. What a promise. This was the only way to escape the wrath of the destroyer that was going to come into this land. And you're like, wait a minute, I have Abraham's blood in my veins. I'm a keeper of the law. I I keep the golden rule. I'm better than my neighbor. I've tried my best. Surely God won't judge me. And I just want you to hear quickly, there's only one way to divert the wrath of God that was going to come in. And it's not going to be through morality, goodness, your efforts. There's only one way that God has given for man to be spared from this day. The only way for the avenger not to kill your firstborn, was the blood has to be applied. The blood has to be applied. It is the only thing that made a distinction between life and death. It wasn't ethnicity. It's not that you're better. Israel, you worship Yahweh. They're worshiping animals and cows that are about to be destroyed. It's, it's, It's the blood. 
It's the blood that's going to make the difference. The blood is the only thing that can avert the wrath of God. Either a dead firstborn or a dead lamb. That was the choice that's put before them this day. God then institutes the Passover as a memorial for the rest of your lives in history. It's to be memorialized forever. You're never to forget, Israel, what God has done in the Passover. And so I'd quickly, I just want to work through one thought. I don't want to get too off, but I think it's worth answering. Why is it the firstborn? It's always the firstborn that gets picked on. Why do they keep going there? Why that? Well, you, Abraham, go offer up your firstborn son, Isaac. And, and so we, there's something about this firstborn. In Exodus 2, as this begins, God says, I want the life of every firstborn. Unless you pay a redemption price, every year they had to pay this, or I want your firstborn. And then at the Passover, the firstborn are all slaughtered. And I just was saying, what, why? And our society just doesn't get this very well in America because we're so individualistic. Most places and times, they were very family-oriented, and one member of your house acted sinfully, and it brought shame upon the whole house. The firstborn was where all the hopes of the family, the heir, and the debt of sin is over a whole family, and God can call it in. All of them were to eat the Passover. The firstborn was liable for the sins of the family. And so the sin debt was called in with Abraham and Isaac. And that night... The sin debt, the avenger comes, and there, there, it says there was wailing and screaming throughout Egypt, and every, can you imagine, everyone's firstborn was killed that night, and they're, they're weeping, and they're screaming, and they're wailing, and even in Pharaoh, the great king's house, the avenger came, the heir to his throne was dead. And in the, all the huts of Goshen, of those in slavery and bondage in that land, not even a dog wagging its tongue at the people of God who had been redeemed that night. They were spared because the sacrifice was not spared. The blood of the lamb was the rescue from the wrath of God. And this people was sent off into the promised land the land flowing with milk and honey and the favorable presence of their God. I'll be your God and you'll be my people. Let this be a remembrance for you, Israel. May you never forget all the days of your life, your great redemption from the slavery. Always remember this deliverance. Before God gives the law in Exodus, he says, you shall remember how God has delivered you out of slavery, the motivation for obedience all your days. And so what I would like to do now, as Joel gave me the assist, is I want you to flip over to Luke chapter 22. <laughs> I want to fast forward just a couple thousand years. And during these thousands of years, every year, Israel has been remembering the Passover. And suddenly an angel appear, appears to Mary it says, Mary, you're going to give birth to the Holy One, the promised Messiah that, that the whole Old Testament has been promising and pointing to. And Jesus comes into this world and he remembers the Passover every year of his life. And now at the close of his life, his last one on earth, he says, I earnestly desire to eat the Passover with you. Isn't that a beautiful statement? I, I earnestly desire to have this Passover meal with you, as it will be his last one on earth until the new, uh, the great banquet celebration in heaven. But during this Passover, some amazing things happen. This is going to be different than any Passover for 2,000 years. And as the Passover now is clearly being shown to be a type. And so I just love how God can paint history. Everything we just read, God's painting and doing to give us a picture of a Passover lamb who would come in the world and save us. So it should take your breath away to serve a God like this. And the reality to which it pointed all these years is now being inaugurated on that night in the upper room discourse. And we get to sit in the room this morning as it happens and it's fulfilled and inaugurated. Uh, look at Luke 22, 7. <coughs> 
Then came the first day of unleavened bread on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. And now we're going to see that even in the Passover account, we see the need for a greater Passover. You remember back in Exodus 12, 22, he says, no one should go outside of their house. Why? Because you'll be destroyed. Unless you stay in the house and have the blood cover, you're going to be destroyed. So there's something bigger going on. It's your sin. It's your sin. If you come out, you're going to be destroyed by the avenger. The avenger will destroy you because of your sin and your guilt. You have a greater slavery and bondage than physical and economically in the land of Egypt. You are a slave to sin. And you're born into it and you're born in bondage. The dominion rules and reigns over everyone who's been born of Adam. And God said the soul that sins must die. That's how we come into the world. And when the avenger comes, you'll surely be slain. In Revelation, they're hiding under rocks and wailing and weeping and, and nothing can hide them from the, from the sage of the wrath of the Almighty God against them. He's coming. And he's coming to judge the living and the dead when he returns. And please hear this. The ones without the blood of Christ applied to the door of your heart or will receive more than the death of your firstborn but an eternal unending wrath of God that will go forever and ever and ever and ever. Unless the blood is applied. That's the heart and the plea of the gospel. We need a lamb. We need a substitute to avert the wrath of God. Our death or the death of a lamb is the only option. And so let's come and look at the remedy for our great problem. The slavery that holds all of mankind at present and in bondage is the deepest slavery that's ever been known in the history of this world, and it's the slavery of sin. And I want you just to listen to what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 5, 7. Clean out the old leaven that you may be a new lump, just as you are in fact unleavened. For Christ, our Passover, also has been sacrificed. And Peter says in 1 Peter 1, knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your futile way of life inherited from your forefathers, but with precious blood as of a lamb unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. For he was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but has appeared in these last times for the sake of you. So let's look at the picture of our lamb together. Every house went out and picked the best of the best from the flocks. They got the year old, which was the prime of life. And it was without blemish, spotless, pure, undefiled, and without sin. And that is the Messiah that would go up on a cross for us. The only one who ever lived in perfection. The only one who never deserved to be on a cross. The Son of God. And that lamb was to be slain. And it was a bloody death as they cut its throat. And Jesus was tortured and beaten and nailed up on a cross and blood everywhere. He was to be roasted by fire. As Jesus is enduring three hours of the full wrath of God on the cross, he cries out at the end, I thirst. I thirst as I'm bearing the full wrath of God. I thirst for God. There'll be no leftovers. He'll be completely consumed as a sacrifice. Then there'll be the putting on of the blood, which is the atonement of Jesus Christ. It is the only wrath averter known to mankind. And that blood applied will have the wrath of God pass over you on judgment. And then the eating of the meal is the sign of faith. It's the sign of faith. It's not just looking, but it's taking the bread of life, and eating his flesh and drinking his blood. It's taking Christ to be your own by faith, to love him and treasure him and take him in. The whole lamb was to be eaten. We're to feed upon the whole Christ, the prophet, the priest, and the king. A whole Christ for the whole man. We don't take parts of Christ. We take all of Christ. He's eaten with unleavened bread and bitter herbs, 
The most joyous experience also has sorrow and brokenness over your sin when you realize you've sinned against God and it brings a deep grief and a repentance from sin that will bring life. And then it was slain and eaten at twilight. And so the Lamb of God bowed his head in victory. So Luke 22, verse 14. Let's start actually verse 12. And he'll show you a large furnished upper room and prepare it there. And they left and they found everything just as he told them. And they prepared the Passover. And so year after year, the faithful Jews celebrated this Passover. And they're commemorating God's faithful action to this nation and that great deliverance we just read about. And on the night in which he was betrayed, Jesus would now take this shadow and he'll reveal its substance of what it pointed to. And he'll give to us the greatest memorial that anyone could ever remember. I pray you never take for granted the Lord's table. There is nothing greater to come together and remember this revised Passover, this fulfilled Passover. So I pray it fills your heart this morning. And just hear those words, I've earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you. Christ longed to bring this thing to fulfillment so that we could eat. Verse 14, when the hour had come, he reclined at the table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I've earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I shall never eat it again, eat it until it's fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he said, take this and share it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine from now on until the kingdom of God comes. And when he had taken some bread and given thanks, he broke it and he gave it to them saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup after they had eaten saying, this cup, which is poured out for you in the new covenant in my blood. But behold, the hand of the one betraying with me at the table. He prophesies about Judas. So now at the Passover, the father, whoever was the head of the family, would stand up and someone would say, why do we have this Passover meal? And, and the father would explain what it was about. And so Jesus does something different than any other Passover that was going on that night. This is not Passover liturgy that I just read. You, you have the unleavened bread and he takes it now and he, he breaks it. And he does something different than their slavery and the table of remembrance. He says, this is my body, which will be broken for you. And so this, this bread at this remembrance is, here's a picture of my body that's going to be broken to deliver you from your slavery and your bondage. The very next night, you're going to hang on Calvary's tree, pierce through for our transgressions, and you're going to deliver us from the greatest bondage of sin. And then he takes the cup, and most of the commentators believe it, there was four cups at the meal of wine, and this is the third cup, and it was called the cup of blessing. And it was to remember the application of the blood on the doorposts and the lentils. And so while everyone that night is remembering the Passover, something different happens now, and Jesus takes that cup and says, this is my blood, which is poured out for you. It's not a Passover lamb, I'm the Passover lamb, and this is my blood that will be spilled so that it will be a wrath averter when the wrath of God comes to punish you for your sin. It will pass over you completely. This is the new covenant in my blood. All of history has been moving to this point at the table. Our firstborn is saved because God's firstborn wasn't. He provided a lamb so that Abraham didn't have to offer up Isaac. Well, God will provide a lamb. And this time God says, I'll lay the wood on my son and no one's going to stop me from plunging the wrath and the sword through his heart. Isaac got to live because my son didn't. You get to live this morning because his firstborn didn't. And that blood applied to your heart is going to pass over the wrath. Matthew says, then they sang a hymn and they went out. And most believe it was the Hallel, most likely Psalm 115 through 118. And I was looking at Psalm 118, open to me the gates of righteousness. I shall enter through them. 
I shall give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord, and the righteous will enter through it. I shall give thanks to thee, for thou answered me, and thou hast become my salvation. The Passover meal was God's act of redemption through the substitution of a lamb. And that was a symbol and a type. And Jesus shows us that he is what it was all pointing to, a greater deliverance than what happened in Egypt. He institutes a new memorial now for the people of God, one greater than Israel ever celebrated. That was just a shadow now becoming reality. So a symbol at the communion table that points us back to the cross. And the true sons of Abraham believe this message. And by faith now, we will celebrate the Lord's table. The sign that the destroyer, when he comes to judge your sins, he will pass over your house because the blood of Jesus has been applied to your heart by faith. And it's not with hyssop brush on a doorpost. He'll bring you to where not even a dog will wag its tongue at you. Our enemies will be conquered at the cross. And so I just want to speak before we go to the table to any unbeliever who's walked in here. And I, I, I want you to hear this clearly out of love. There's only one thing that can avert the destroyer, the wrath of God on this final judgment. And it says it's appointed unto man once to die and then comes judgment. Everyone in this room will die and everyone will face judgment unless the Lord comes back. And I want you to know that your parents' religion will not avert the wrath of God. You're trying to clean up and be a better person will not avert the wrath of God. Saying I don't care to believe this will not avert the wrath of God. This is the greatest reality of your life. You will be killed a second time. In the book of Revelation, it says there'll be a second death. You'll die and you'll die again in eternity in the lake that burns with fire forever. You will be under God's wrath for all of eternity. And God says, why? Why will you perish? Why will you perish when the blood that was shed on Calvary's tree so that you could apply it by faith to your heart and be forgiven of your sins. This is called the table of forgiveness. And there's a way that you could be forgiven and that blood could be put on your heart. And on that judgment day, when the wrath of God comes, it simply will pass over and not even a dog will wag its tongue at you. That's how safe you'll be because of the gospel of Jesus Christ. This morning he offers to put it over your life and your sins so that the wrath of God will pass over you on the last day because it did not pass over the Son of God. It was poured out in undiluted wrath for three hours. The Son of God was spared nothing so you could be spared everything. That's the offer that God puts out and it's received by faith to look away from anything in yourself, to get the wrath off and look only to Jesus and his blood that was shed as the way to get that off of you. So I hold out Jesus and ask that you would believe and surrender your life this morning to him. And then children of God, the bread and the cup that we're now gonna hold point to our Paschal lamb, the lamb of God. And John said, behold the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And so my brothers and sisters in Christ, there's something so much greater than the Red Sea splitting before your eyes and walking through on dry ground and all your enemies being swallowed up. Where you sit this morning is better than where the disciples sat at Passover night. You sit here now with revelation of a crucified Christ who's been raised and has now brought you into the place of faith. So treasure your place at the table this morning. You sit at this Passover table by faith. And you get to remember what Jesus Christ has done on your behalf. Could there be a greater remembrance? And one last thought and we'll partake. They would eat the lamb with other people. And now we get to eat this meal together. We get to behold the lamb together. And we try to help each other 
to get it to sink in deeper. That I, my life is trying to get it to sink in deeper in my heart and yours. We help each other get this clear and clear, keep our eyes focused. We just keep coming back to the Lamb. We take shelter together this morning by faith in the blood of the Lamb. What an ordinance. We're going to go to the promised land. And the climax of history is when the Lamb was slain for our transgressions, and now it's been applied to our lives by grace through faith. The wrath of God simply will pass over my sins on judgment day because he didn't pass over Jesus on that cross. So let's go to the table and treasure and privilege and honor what we get to do now together. Father, I thank you for the beauty of the fulfillment of the Passover meal, the Passover that delivered Israel from bondage and slavery. God, I can't believe what this Passover lamb has done to my bondage and sin. How do we stand before you not guilty with all the sin that we've done? Thank you that there is a way to be not guilty before our God, to be forgiven of all sin, to be wrapped in your righteousness, to have it to our account so that now we are justified. We have peace with God. You've adopted us into your family. God, thank you for what we remember now. Lord, let it overwhelm every heart. Let us go to death boldly because no wrath will ever touch us again. It touched your sons so deeply so that we could be free and we could have no condemnation on our heads. God, thank you that not even a, a drop is left, not even a wagging dog or a barking dog. Thank you how you have set us free from our enemies. God, I pray, let the people of God be blessed and encouraged now as they look their eyes out and behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen.